Okay, today we're going to begin a new chapter on enol and enolate chemistry. So, we're going to be talking a lot about carbonyls. We've talked about how they are used as electrophiles in a lot of systems. Now we're going to talk about how we can change them into nucleophiles. Turns out, carbonyls, when they're in acid or base, they are in equilibrium with another species called an enol. And you only need the slightest amount of acid or the slightest amount of base to catalyze this equilibria. The walls of a beaker, of a glass beaker, are acidic enough to catalyze this. And so it's very difficult to stop this um, equilibrium process. And so if you have a ketone, it's in equilibrium with its enol, same way with aldehydes. Carboxylic acid derivatives to a lesser extent. So, the mechanism of this Say in base, you deprotonate the alpha carbon, and the alpha carbon in this case is a carbon attached right to the carbon in all the C double bond O. This hydrogen right here is what's referred to as an enolizable hydrogen. Now, I'm just showing the major resonance structure. Normally, you depronate the lone pair goes on the atom attached to the hydrogen, but we're in resonance, and this is the major resonance structure. And then if you protonate, you have the enol. And of course, this mechanism is completely reversible. And this mechanism, this reaction of converting between a carbonyl and its enol is something called tautomerization. Tautomers are constitutional isomers that differ only by the position of a pi bond and a hydrogen. So this is the base atomization process. The acid one is like the base one, only in reverse. Instead of protonating the oxygen last, you protonate it first. And then the reverse mechanism is like so.
So that's tautomerization. Now, when it comes to the equilibrium structures of enols, enols have a tendency to be the unstable version with very few exceptions. Like if we have acetaldehyde, its enol structure is this. At equilibrium, the percent of an enol is 0 0.002 percent. If you compare that to acetone, its enol is 0 0.00025%. So, so there really isn't much enol present at any given time. Now, granted, some compounds are more likely to form enols than others. Um, one such compound is acetoacetone. Here is this enol. And depending on what solvents you have, you have a different percentage of, of enol. So when the solvent is of water, 20% of the molecule exi is existing as the enol form. When you're in hexane, 92% of it exists as the enol. And the reason for this discrepancy is here's the structure of hexane. Here's the structure of water. Hexane is nonpolar. Water is polar. Plus, water has OH bonds that it can use for hydrogen bonding. Why this makes a difference is this molecule, the enol, has an internal hydrogen bond. And that makes that quite stable in hexane. But when you're in water, the equilibrium is shifted because you start to have hydrogen bonds with the water itself. And so it doesn't necessarily need the extra stability due to this. Now there are some compounds out there, like say this cyclic compound right here, that exists 100% in the enol form. And that's mainly because the enol form of this compound has benzene resonance. But for the most part, enols are unstable and they could, should be considered as mechanistic intermediates and not necessarily um, starting materials. Okay. So, why we're talking about enols? Well, there is a reaction 
called an aldol reaction. And it's an extremely important reaction in biology. It's also an extremely important reaction in synthetic organic chemistry. So if you take an aldehyde and treat it with sodium hydroxide and water, you can get this product, which is the aldol product. And if you let it go too long, you get this product, which is, oops, I had the double bond in the wrong place, this product, which is the aldol condensation product. So, the way this reaction works is the blue hydrogen here is the acidic hydrogen, pK roughly around 20 or so. The red hydrogen right here, I want to be very, very clear, not acidic, there's a pKa of 45. A lot of people, when doing this mechanism, try to pull off that hydrogen there. Don't. You always pull off what's the called the enolizable hydrogen, the hydrogen attached to the carbon, attached to the carbonyl. And that gives the enolate. And this is your nucleophile. Because all an enolate is, it's a resonance stabilized carbanion. One that can be done in water, which is nature's solvent. Most carbanions are too basic to exist in water. But this carbanion isn't. It can exist in water. And then, once you have your nucleophile, you have it attack the electrophile. And all of these steps are reversible. Now what's happening in here, if you want to think about it, is you have the, the minor resonance structure of the enolite interacting with the minor resonance structure of the carbonyl, the C minus C plus. You're forming a new bond between those two carbons, giving you this. It's best to be able to draw the mechanism just like that. But this is essentially what's going on here. And then you protonate the oxygen. And you get the aldol product. Now the aldol name itself is actually named after the product, not after anyone in specific. If you look at the product, it consists of an aldehyde and an alcohol. You throw those two words together, 
you get the aldol reaction. Now we'll talk about the mechanism for the condensation product a little bit later on. Now this reaction can be done in acid or base. It's typically more likely to be done under basic conditions. Acidic conditions is typically done with a Lewis acid or so, but we'll just use um, we'll just use H3O plus. And so the way the acidic conditions work is the enolate is too basic to react, is too basic to exist in acidic conditions. So instead, your nucleophile is an enol. But typically carbonyls are not reactive enough to react with enols. So they have to be activated first. So here's the mechanism. start by making the enol, and that's that tautomerization reaction. So you protonate, and get the enol, and then you have a protonated carbonyl come in and the electrons from the O swing down these electrons go over here these electrons go up And to finish up the mechanism, you just deprotonate. Now, when it comes to the acid catalyzed mechanism, typically you get the aldol product and what's called the aldol condensation product with the alkene in there where the OH has been eliminated, but typically this is the major one in, in acidic conditions. But we will get to that at a later time. But this is just sort of the acid mechanism of the aldol. Aldol products have a very distinct pattern. The 
They are three hydroxycarbonyls. Now, we're going to talk about a new type of problem. Um, some people call these retrosynthetic problems. I call them breakdowns, mainly because that's how I was taught. The idea is you're breaking down a target product into simpler molecules. Say this is our target. We want to figure out what molecules were used to make this. And for this, we're going to use a special type of arrow called a retrosynthetic arrow. Like so. You might have seen these in um, previous classes, but think of this. Um, the best analogy I ever heard was um, you basically, what this arrow is doing is you think of this molecule here as an ugly baby. Yes, they do exist. I've seen pictures of one. I've seen pictures of me when I was a baby. Yes, they do very much exist. And the whole idea is what you do is you look at this ugly baby and you try to picture what the parents look like. But what you don't want to know are any of the details necessary to make that ugly baby. And I think I just threw up, my, threw up in my mouth. Sorry. Thinking my own baby pictures. Just, ugh. Okay. Anyways. So, anyway. The idea is you want to come up with what two molecules were used to make this without any of the details. And the aldol reaction really lends itself well because it's a very distinct pattern. It's a 3-hydroxycarbonyl. And the way to go backwards to figure out what the molecules are is you simply redraw the molecule over here. And you break the 2, 3 bond. So get rid of that 2, 3 bond. Carbon 2 gets a hydrogen. Carbon 3 becomes a carbonyl. So this OH right here goes away and it becomes a carbonyl. And these are the necessary starting materials to give you that product right there. Now that's without any sort of details. The details are messy. In fact, let's make this a little bit messier. Let's add another carbon to carbon 2 on both sides really to show how messy this can get. We need to do that. So if you simply take these two molecules and mix them with sodium hydroxide and water, 
Well, what you have is this has an enolizer proton, so therefore this can be the nucleophile. This is an aldehyde, so it can be an electrophile. So you can get the product that you want. However, this right here also has an enolizable hydrogen. So that can be a nucleophile. Starting material, the other molecule has a carbonyl, specifically an aldehyde. It can be an electrophile. So you can get this product. But wait, there's more. This can act as both a nucleophile and an electrophile. Giving you that product. Same way with this one. giving you that product. It's even worse. You don't get four products out of this. There's actually 16 products shown because we are creating two more chiral centers. And either one of those could be R or S. As a result, that gives you 16 different combinations. Plus alkenes. Okay, that's a lot of possibilities. That's why nature loves this reaction. Because with two starting materials, you get all sorts of possibilities of products. Now nature isn't limited like we are. It can use enzymes to basically designate which one's the nucleophile, which one's the electrophile, and where they are attacking together to give you one molecule out of these 16 possibilities, or even more if you count the aldol condensation products. We, on the other hand, aren't quite so lucky. So there is a way of cleanly getting just one of these um, sets of isomers in here. And to help us out, we need to be able to use these breakdowns. So if we were trying to just make this product right here, the way we go about it we start by breaking it down. Three hydroxycarbonyl. You break the two three bond. Carbon 2 gets a hydrogen. Carbon 3 
becomes a carbonyl. Okay. Now, this step right here is key in the breakdown. Carbon 2 gets your hydrogen. That's this hydrogen right here. Even though we don't draw it in a lot of the times, that's the hydrogen that's important. This is the hydrogen that is pulled off to make the nucleophile. And so this breakdown can also be used to help you figure out mechanisms as well. So C2 gets an H. So that hydrogen is what you use. That's the one you want your base to pull off. This molecule right here is your nucleophile. This molecule with C3 is your electrophile. Okay. Now, with that in mind, you start with your molecule that's going to be your nucleophile. Start with it alone. And in the presence of a non-protic solvent like ether, you add a strong base called LDA. LDA stands for lithium diisopropyl amid. And this is a very strong hindered base. Conjugate pKa of 35. And all it does is it takes a proton off, like so. And it's a strong base. This has a pKa of 20. This has a pKa of 35. So it's an irreversible reaction. And that is key. It's irreversible. It rapidly transforms your carbonyl into your enolate and doesn't go back. LDA designates which molecule is the nucleophile. Now, you simply can't just take your molecule and without the electrophiles and add in hydroxide. Because the problem with that is yes, you'll get your enolate. This has a pKa of 20. Water, though, has a pKa of 15. The left side is more favor, and so you can never fully deprotonate all of it when you just use an alkoxide base. It's just not strong enough. And so as a result, you have this and this together at the same time. But with the with LDA, though, you irreversibly deprotonate, and so as a result, you don't have the enolate and the carbonyl together at the same time, because all the carbonyl has been deprotonated. It's now a nucleophile, not an electrophile. And once you have that, in the presence of ether, you add in your electrophile.
And then once you've added in your electrophile and all of it's reacted, only then do you add in a very small amount of a proton source, just enough to protonate the O minus and not enough to do any other reactions like start the elimination. And that's how you can clearly get this molecule here. Now granted, you're still going to have mixtures of stereoisomers. When it comes to aldol mycoclasin chemistry, you're not going to have to worry about the stereochemistry of these. It's too complicated. Um, there's another class called Chem 547 and also synthesis classes at graduate level synthesis class that talks about this reaction in more detail and tells you how you can actually predict which diastereomer you get over the others and that's due to something called the Zimmerman-Traxler transition state. Don't need to know this. Um, I'm only bringing it up because Howard Zimmerman was a professor here at Wisconsin. Um, Marge Traxler was actually an undergraduate. This work was done when he was actually at Purdue, and Traxler was his undergraduate at Purdue. And they discovered um, something by looking at the stereochemistry of reactions similar to this. And now um, there's basically a transition state named after an undergraduate and Professor Howard Zimmerman, who um, actually was a leader in the field of photochemistry and physical organic chemistry for years. Um, he unfortunately passed away a few years ago. So anyways, enough about the plugs for UW and everything like that. So, all right. Okay, now. I did mention something about when you do an aldol reaction, and this, by the way, is what's called a self-condensation. That's where the nucleophile and the electrophile are the same molecules. In examples of self-condensation, you can use alkoxides. But there's a good chance you'll end up with a lot of the condensation product. If your nucleophile and your electrophile are different molecules, if you want a clean reaction, you need to use LDA. But if you're using a self-condensation reaction, you can use hydroxide, but keep in mind you're going to get some of this aldol condensation product as well. Let's talk about how this is formed. Start out with the aldol mechanism. So you deprotonate to form the enolate. And the enolate attacks the carbonyl. Followed by protonation.
Now, that gets you to the Aldol product. To get to the aldol condensation product, we have to eliminate water. Do an elimination reaction. Now, we've talked about elimination reactions in Chem 341. We had two versions. We had the E1 version, where the leaving group leaves. Then you take the beta hydrogen off. And this is the mechanism an acid catalyzed aldols. But it's not the mechanism in base catalyzed because the E1 reaction involves a carbocation and carbocations don't like to be formed in base. We also talked about the E2 reaction in Chem 343. Well, it's a simultaneous event. The leaving group leaves as the beta hydrogen. It's taken off. But this is not the mechanism because OH is a bad leaving group. For E2. So the mechanism for this elimination is a third type of elimination. It's called an E1CB mechanism. And what it is, is it's the opposite of the E1. You take the, the beta hydrogen off first, then the leaving group is kicked off. And this is what's used for poor leaving groups. that have acidic H's next to them. So what this looks like This hydrogen has a pKa of around 20. The base comes and takes this proton off, and you form an enolate. Then you use the enolates electrons, the O minus swings down, kicks these electrons over, and that kicks off the OH ions. And that gives rise to the aldol condensation product. Okay, that's really all the time that we have. We'll pick this up on Monday. 
Wait, we do have time for one more thing. It's just another breakdown for the aldol. And this is you looking at condensation products. And aldol condensation products, you can recognize them because they are what are called alpha, beta, unsaturated carbonyls. The alpha carbon of a carbonyl is right next to it. The beta carbon is there, and you have a double bond between the alpha carbon and the beta carbon. So it's an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. Other way of thinking about it is you have a if you number the um, carbonyl as one, you have a two three double bond. The aldol breakdown is really straightforward for these. You break the 2-3 bond. In fact, you break both of those. Carbon 2 gets two H's and carbon three becomes a carbonyl. Except in this case, you actually have to draw in the oxygen. Okay. And we'll talk on on Monday, or actually on Friday during office hours.